Uh, we are happy to have you with us this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer so we can move right into our Bible study tonight. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you for this opportunity once again to go to the Word of God. Master, there's so much learning, there's so much wisdom, there is so much guidance that we glean from the Word of the Lord. And in this subject matter especially, it is so important that we understand these things from a biblical Christian perspective because our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. It is a spiritual battle, and it requires spiritual warfare. It requires spiritual weaponry. It requires that we prepare ourselves spiritually so that we might come out on the other end of the battle victorious through the marvelous, wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We ask God that you would anoint tonight the teacher, anoint the ear of every hearer. Allow us, O oh God, to receive from the word of the Lord. Let us soak in that knowledge that we're about to be offered through the word of God. For we ask it in none other than Jesus, Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Now, we started talking in the last week or two, we started talking about the concept of ghosts. Uh, we were talking about the fact that from a biblical Christian perspective, there is absolutely no room for ghosts. The, the Word of God does not say one single word about human spirits lingering in the earth after death. The Word of God teaches that immediately after death, the spirit of man returns to God. That's what Scripture declares. And in that doesn't mean it goes to God physically, so to speak, but rather it means it becomes God's property once again. And as God's property, he makes the judgment as to where that spirit is going to ride out, as it were, uh, until the uh, resurrection of all men, good and evil, and they will stand before the Lord in the great white throne judgment before the judgment seat of Christ. So uh, every soul, excuse me, every spirit according to the word of God uh, is going to go to one of two destinations. Now I've said before and I'll say it again and I know this is controversial to many but uh, I've never been one to much shy away from controversy. Uh, that's why I get attacked as much as I do, because I tend to open my big mouth and say things. But uh, as I've been talking, um, I do not believe for one moment that hell is going to be the same identical experience for every a person who winds up there, the spirit of every man that winds up in hell is not going to experience the same level of punishment, the same level of uh, torture, agony, whatever term you want to employ. The Word of God tells us plainly that the Lord is going to judge every man according to his works. We are not saved by works. Works will not get you into heaven. But they will determine what kind of uh, experience you have in eternity. Even here on earth, we send people to certain prisons based on the crime that they've committed. You know, they actually talk about um, prisons that are, are like... Uh, you know, uh, white-collar uh, criminal prisons, you know, they tend to be uh, clubs, social clubs, you know, and uh, versus, obviously, the hardcore penitentiaries that those who murder and rape and molest and what have you might go to. Uh, God is a fair God. God is a just God. 
everything our God does is right and just, and he is not going to unfairly, unjustly punish someone. That's not what most Christian churches preach, because fear is their primary uh, message. They're trying to scare people into joining the church and putting money in their offering plates and filling their pews. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm probably the most foolish preacher on the face of the planet because I've got an empty church at the moment. We've only been here briefly in uh, Huntsville, and I should be using fear and condemnation and guilt to fill the pews. Can't do it because that's not the message of the gospel. So I can't use those things because that is not our message. Our message is the love of God. Our message is the grace of God. Our message is hope. Our message is healing. Our message is restoration. And uh, it is joy. So I can't preach all that negative foolishness just to try to scare people into the pew. Although I promise you, that message is way more effective way more effective than the message I preach. There are so many people in our world today who believe that they're supposed to go to church to be abused. They're supposed to go to church to be screamed and hollered at and told that they're inadequate and they're not doing enough and they're not doing right and blah, blah, blah. It's like an abused wife who grows to believe that she deserves the abuse that her husband heaps upon her. And there are many young girls who grow up in homes with a father who's, who's abusive, and they wind up with a man who's abusive because they believe that is what marriage looks like. They think that's what a husband is supposed to look like. Well, many Christians in the world today are so accustomed to that negative, fear-mongering, hateful, condemnatory, judgmental message, and they believe that's what church is supposed to look like. It is not. Well, having said that, um, Hell may not be the same for everybody, but whether you like it or not, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And I do preach that because that is the truth. Uh, so when we die, our spirit returns to God. It becomes once again his possession. He then has the option. It's going to go here or it's going to go here. One of two places. And uh, God makes that judgment. It is appointed unto men once to die. Once to die. That doesn't leave any room for reincarnation. That doesn't leave any room for past life regression. It is appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. So there's no room in Christian teaching for ghosts. However, we absolutely believe that there are spiritual beings which operate within the spirit realm and they interact with human beings. Uh, we've talked about it in prior studies. There are three levels of interaction that demon spirits, evil spirits, wicked spirits, ungodly spirits, whatever term you want to use, there are three levels of interaction that these spirits engage in with the human family, and that is vexation, oppression, and possession. Now, tonight what we're going to begin to do is I'm going to show you a couple of clips from some actual television programs. And we're going to look at these clips, and then we're going to discuss them from a biblical Christian perspective. I wasn't able to do this, Amy, in our last uh, Bible study in um, Dallas when we, we did our Paranormal 101 study. I didn't have the software that I have now. But I'm actually going to share these, and I hope to heavens we don't wind up with any trouble relative to copyright. We're not profiting from the use of these videos in any way, nor are we using them in any sort of a 
uh, commercial way. Uh, we're using them strictly so that we can critique and commentary. So anyway, uh, we want to get started this evening, and I want to start out by showing you, um, first of all, let's, we've been talking about Ouija boards and how they play a role. So let's watch this clip if we may. Whoops, uh, sure. Here we go. I'm going to go ahead at this point and stop that clip. I've told this story in the past, and those of you who have been with our ministry for any length of time, you've heard me talk about uh, a friend of mine in New York City that I knew many years ago. He and I had just met, have known each other very long, and one day he invited me over to his apartment in Brooklyn for dinner. Um, I went over to his house, and mind you, I'm going to tell you, um, I was not in church at this time. This is during the time I was out of church before I had come back, and uh, I was out of church, but I went to his home for dinner, and uh, he had a nice little apartment, and the main room was just one great big long narrow room. He had the dining room on one end by the kitchen that went off to the left. And then he had the living room. And off of the living room was the little bathroom right in the middle of the apartment. And then there were two bedrooms on the front end of the apartment. And he shared it with a roommate. Um, 
at one point, I had to use the restroom. And I went into the restroom, and I closed the door behind me. And I noticed when I closed the door behind me that you got that little bit of a suction at the door, which indicates that the room, in essence, is airtight. The uh, landlord had actually placed weather stripping at the base of the uh, door. And I suppose he did that for the purpose of trying to keep the moisture and everything in the bathroom. And of course, there was a fan you could turn on um, in the bathroom for exhaust. Uh, but I had not turned the fan on. And I am there in the bathroom, and all of a sudden, the, the curtain on his tub began to flow violently. I mean, almost like somebody was taking it and shaking it. It was just going crazy. And I'm looking at it, <laughs> and I'm like, there's no breeze, there's no air movement, there's no kind of um, uh, air, you know, doing anything here. And uh, the room is, is pretty much, you know, airtight. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting. But I, you know, I didn't get too worried about it. I had a feeling something was going on, but I didn't want to worry about it. Then we ate, and he said to me, uh, I think we were talking. Anybody who knows me knows I love uh, home decorating and design and layout and stuff like that. And I think I may have talked to him and said something about, have you ever thought about doing your living room like this and, and putting the sofa over here and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I had all these ideas because I liked the room he had, but I, I just saw a way I thought he might lay it out. He might like it better. And he had two of those three-fold screens the old-fashioned, you know, the ladies used to change their clothes behind those screens that have hinges in them, you know. And uh, he had two of those. And the way that he divided his rooms, he had the living room on one end, the dining room on the other. And he had one of those screens on either side of the room coming out from the wall. And then he had an opening in the middle leading from the living room into the dining room. And I, the way that I had suggested to him was, I said, why don't you run those screens concurrently from the opposite wall, and then you have your passage to the dining room over here by the bathroom door, and that way, that almost creates like two rooms, and then you can put your love seat against that, and your tables here, and blah, 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 blah. And so he liked my ideas. And he said, well, would you help me to do that? He said, I'd like to change it around. That sounds really cool. I like those ideas. So we changed the entire living room around. Every piece of furniture, sofas, love seat, chairs, ottomans, tables, lamps, uh, the, the uh, three-way blinds, everything. We changed everything around in that room. And then he asked me, he said, I, I got to ask you some kind of strange. He said, would you mind terribly helping me flip my mattress? And uh, I said, no, you know, I wouldn't mind helping you flip your mattress. I know some of you old bad-minded folks are thinking that was a sneaky way to get me somewhere. But it wasn't. He really wanted to flip his mattress. So we went into his bedroom. He had like a queen-size bed, so he had quite a big mattress, you know. And I helped him flip the mattress and everything. It only took a few minutes. We came back into the living room. And folks, I kid you not, God is my witness, all the furniture had returned to the position it was in before we changed it. Now, you want to talk about stopping you dead in your tracks and making you think, what on earth is going on here? You know, what's happening here? Uh, that just shocked Paul right out of his socks. He was like, what, what happened? What's going on? He said, how did that happen? And I looked at him and I said, Paul, I said, I'm going to tell you something. 
It's not altogether new to me. I said, you know, at the time I used to tell people, uh, as many LGBT people who have left the church and left ministry, you know, I said, Paul, I'm a former Pentecostal preacher in uh, this doesn't surprise me. I've, I've experienced things like this before. I said, I hate to tell you, but you've got some spiritual activity going on here. And he said, you think? <laughs> and and um, so I began to ask him, because from a biblical Christian perspective, I understand that a door has to be opened, whether it be intentional or unintentional. So I begin to ask him kind of the standard questions that I ask people who are experiencing things like this. And I said, have you ever consulted a psychic, a medium? Have you ever uh, utilized uh, objects of... Um, divination that can include uh, items like Ouija boards and, uh, excuse me, like Ouija boards and tarot cards and trying to conduct seances and things of this nature. Have you ever experimented with um, witchcraft or anything of that nature? And he said, actually, my roommate and I have tried to utilize a Ouija board. He said, my grandmother raised me and uh, I called her mom. She said, I didn't call my grandparents, grandma and grandpa. I called them mom and dad. My parents left me with them when I was a baby. So they were mom and dad to me. He said, I was very close to my mom. And he said, when she died, uh, I was very heartsick and hurt. And he said, a, a few months ago, my roommate asked me, why don't we try to use a Ouija board and see if we can't communicate with her? Well, because, of course, he was so close to this lady, he was curious. And he said, well, yeah, we can try that. So they brought in a Ouija board and they began to experiment with it. And uh, so I said, okay. I said, well, I hate to tell you, but a Ouija board is probably the, I would say it's either the number one or number two way that in today's world, people wind up inviting spiritual activity. Uh, the reason I say it's either number one or number two, because the other one that kind of comes in a real, real close first or second would be just sheer curiosity. You know the old saying, curiosity killed the cat. When it comes to supernatural, paranormal, spiritual things, curiosity will cause you a lot of hurt and a lot of harm. Because curiosity makes people go where they shouldn't go, do what they shouldn't do, experiment with things they shouldn't experiment with. So anyway, I said, you know, the Ouija board's right at the top of the list for ways that people invite spiritual activity. Even though I was out of church, I said to him, I said, if you'd like, I can come in uh, and do a, a, what I call an expulsion. It's cleaning out the house, ridding it of these spirits. And he said, well, yeah, I'd love for you to do that. He said, could you come tomorrow maybe? He said, if you don't mind, if, could you come like 9 because i got to be to work by 10 and, and I'll let you have the apartment all day. Do what you got to do. You know, he didn't want to be there. So the next day I went over. I bought some olive oil, uh, prayed over it. Olive oil's not magic. It's not, uh, there, there's no power in olive oil. But olive oil is the only substance. There's no such thing as holy water in the Word of God. No such thing as holy water. Nowhere do you see anybody in the New Testament using holy water. But they did use olive oil. The Word of God tells us that even the apostles... In, during the ministry of Jesus went about anointing the sick with olive oil and they were healed. So olive oil uh, in scripture represents the Spirit of God. It represents the Holy Spirit. 
part of the reason I could give you all the reasons uh, that olive oil is a perfect representation of the Spirit of God, but I, I don't want to do that right now because, you know, we're on limited time here. So, but olive oil is a beautiful, beautiful, perfect representation of the Spirit of God. When you apply olive oil to something, all you're doing is... Uh, in a physical sense, representing the presence of God. You're inviting the presence of God and you're applying the presence of God. When you pray for the sick, you're applying. You anoint them with all. All you're doing is inviting the Spirit of God into their body, into their situation. And um, I've preached on it recently for those of you that actually are part of our ministry online, and you know I've talked about it. The Word of God said, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. So the presence of God alone is powerful enough to bring healing and deliverance. So when you apply the presence, when you bring the presence of God into the situation, honey, that's all you need to drive out demons. That's all you need to drive out sickness. That's all you need to drive out oppression and possession and vexation. So I went through his house room by room and I anoint every wall. I anoint the front and back of every door. I anoint the, even the closet doors. I anoint the back of the closet wall literally in every room, go through the entire house, and I uh, invite the presence of God, and I worship the Lord as I'm doing this, because the Word of God says that God inhabits the praises of His people. If you want to bring the presence of God into a place or into a situation, just start worshiping the Lord, and the presence of God will come. He responds to worship. And so I worship the Lord. I'm singing. I'm praising the Lord. And I'm going through and I'm anointing everyone. And I'm saying, Master, we invite you into every corner, every crevice, every dark space, every hidden space of this home. We invite your presence. And anything that is unclean, anything that is unholy is unwelcome. And we cast it forth in the name of Jesus. And I go through the entire house and I do this. When I get to the end and I've done every wall and I've gone through the whole house, then I open the door to the home and I command whatever spirits that are present that are not of God to immediately leave. And many, many times I've experienced where as the spirits are leaving, I literally can identify them one by one. I discern them. The Holy Ghost in me begins to discern the spirits as they're departing. And that's what happened. As they were leaving, I could literally feel them just almost like people walking out past you. And I felt one, and I said, okay, that one represented itself as a woman. And according to the storyline that she offered, she died uh, in a fire in this building. All that information came to me just as I'm standing there. said, this spirit claims that it was a woman who died in a fire. Uh, and then the next spirit comes by and this spirit was supposed to have been a construction worker who worked on the Brooklyn Bridge. You know, they use storylines that seem plausible, okay? Paul didn't live very far from the Brooklyn Bridge. So they use storylines that are plausible to try to make the, their presence legitimate. If a spirit can legitimize its identity, if it can make you believe that it has some legitimate connection to the place, then a lot of times people become very foolish and they say, well, bless God, this person lived here for many years and I can't ask them to leave. And they wind up giving that spirit permission now to reside there and to stay there. 
because they don't understand. They're not dealing with who they think they're dealing with. They're dealing with a demonic spirit that is assuming an identity that gives them some legitimacy, okay, and validity for their presence. So, the third spirit, I literally could feel it just like, almost like it nudged me with its shoulder as it was leaving. It was defiant. What I failed to mention was, as I was going through the house doing this uh, cleansing, this uh, expulsion, I kept hearing a multitude of voices, like several voices, speaking in my ear, and they were saying over and over again, Sam, 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 Sam. And I kept hearing Sam over and over and over and over and over and over again. Well, when Paul got home and I went back, because I didn't stay at his house all day, once I'd done the expulsion, I left and I later came back. When I came back, uh, we were talking, and Paul said to me, how many spirits do you think were here? And I said to him, I don't think anything. I can tell you exactly how many were here. And uh, he said, well, how many were there? I said, there were three. One represented itself as a woman, two represented themselves as men. And then I said to him, Paul, who on earth is Sam? And when I said that, boy, his eyes got big <laughs> like saucers. And he looked at me and he said, oh my God. He said, what you're telling me right now is too much. He said, I've got to call my roommate real quick. His roommate was on vacation on the West Coast visiting family. And Paul literally got on his phone, called his roommate and they were speaking, and he told his roommate, he said, I can't explain everything to you right now. I said, I'll tell you when you get home. He said, but what were the names of the people we talked to on the Ouija board? And his roommate told him, and Paul said, I thought so. And uh, he said, I I'll explain everything to you later. Well, he hangs up, and he turns around, and he says to me, you said there were two that represented themselves as men and one that represented itself as a woman who died in a fire. He said, there were three that we talked to on the Ouija board. He said, the first one was a woman named Eve who is supposed to have jumped out the window of this level, this apartment, at, because the building was on fire. And he said, in this building, there was a restaurant on the first floor, a pizza restaurant. He said, this building did burn several years back, and it lay empty for a long time. He said, and then finally, the landlord that we have now bought it, and he restored it, and he rebuilt it. He said, we're the first tenants since uh, he rebuilt, and everything was brand new, all new sheetrock and everything, you know. And... Uh, he said, but that was the first one. He said, then there was this construction worker who was supposed to have worked on the Brooklyn Bridge whose name was Joe. He said, so far, you, you're hitting it 100%. He said, but when you asked me who Sam was, he said, that really flabbergasted me. And I had to double check with my roommate. He said, I just wanted to make absolutely sure that that, that was absolutely right. He said that was the third person we talked to on the Ouija board. And I said to Paul, as soon as he said that, I said to him, and you never spoke to the other two again. And again, Paul looks at me and he's like, how do you know this? How do you know this? I said, because... I, I was involved in this kind of ministry for a long time as I know how they work. I know how they operate. You're dealing with principalities and powers. You're dealing with levels of authority. You're literally going up the chain. You're going from a private to a corporal to a 
sergeant or lieutenant or however it works. I, I'm not really altogether familiar with the ranking system in the U.S. Army, but you're going up the ladder. I say that when you get up usually to a certain point, they don't allow you to ever speak to anyone else but them. Because you've gotten to a level, and they're not going to let you. You don't need to deal with the small guys anymore. The smaller guys, remember what we've talked about, folks, their job is to get you more curious. Their job is to get you more interested. Their job is to get you to throw that open that door open a little bit further yet. Okay, but once they've got you to open that door enough to bring a strong enough spirit in, then the strong man, the more powerful spirit, is going to take charge. And you will never talk to the lower echelons again. And the interesting thing is, many, many, many times, if you've ever experimented with a Ouija board, there may be people watching me right now, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, what I'm about to say. Many, many times, they'll tell you, they'll say, no, that person can't come talk anymore. You can't talk, that person can't talk anymore. And if you say, why, oftentimes they will respond, they're being punished. And the reason that this sometimes happens is because the spirit, the lower echelon spirit, has actually said too much or done something it was not supposed to do. They are supposed to remain very vague. If you ever notice when you watch these paranormal shows, these, these so-called ghost shows, you know, every bit of information these people get is so vague. It is just a word here or a word there. And then their imagination takes off and they fill in all the blanks. You never see somebody produce a video where they're having a conversation with the spirit and they ask a question and you hear a clear answer. You hear a clear sentence or paragraph. No, never. And of course, our great paranormal experts have explanations for everything. Well, it takes so much energy for them to communicate with us, and that's why they can only communicate. Where do you get that from? Where do you get that from? Who, who says that that's the case? What authority are you basing that theory on? It, it's conjecture. The Word of God talks about as believers, we bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. Why? Because our imaginations can run and we can get all kinds of evil imaginations. We can get all kinds of unscriptural imaginations, ungodly imaginations. And I don't mean, you know, lusting after somebody. And No, I'm talking about beliefs and doctrines and thoughts that contradict the Word of God. Because as I've said over and over again as a believer, the Word of God is our foundation and it is our final answer. So, uh, I told Paul, I said, I guarantee you, you never talk to anybody after you talk to Sam, and he said, you're absolutely right. He said, he told us that the others couldn't talk anymore. He said, we didn't know why, but he told us the others couldn't talk anymore. And I said, well, I'm not surprised. I said, but uh, your house is clean. They're gone. But you opened the door and you invited them. I said, so uh, you've got to make sure you don't make the mistake of opening that door again. And uh, so now we see in this story with this young lady uh, that we just looked at a few moments ago, she experimented with a Ouija board, and in very short order, while she's sitting there playing with it, that spirit entered. It came into the room. But we've got people are going to try to tell you, oh, that was the ghost of a woman. That was a person. That was a this. That was a that. And... Uh, what vested interest would a 
the spirit of a human being have in tearing things up and breaking things like the glass. And then moments later, those very things reappearing, reconstituted. How is it that people can believe that when you die, all of a sudden you become a wizard? You know, you become magic. You have all these magic powers. Again, where do you get that belief from? What authority has told us that after death you become, you know, Harry Potter and all of a sudden you can make something tear up and, and float around in the room and then moments later reappear. And by the way, uh, the night that I had told Paul about the Ouija board, you know, the first night before I came back to do the expulsion, I told him, I said, you've got to get that out of your house. And he put it in a storage closet out in the hallway that went with his apartment, but it wasn't in his apartment. The way the landlord had redesigned, uh, you know, the uh, apartments and everything, he gave each apartment a, a storage room. Uh, there were only two. There was a the restaurant on the first level, an apartment on the second, and an apartment on the third, and it was a walk-up. At the top of the stairs, at each level, there was a closet with a lock, and that was for storage. And Paul had taken the Ouija board and put it out of a closet in his, in his bedroom, put it into the closet in the hallway, trying to get it out of his house. I came the next day to perform the expulsion, and the first thing he said to me was, you're not going to believe this. He said, you saw me put that Ouija board out in the hall closet yesterday, didn't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you know when I went to get my coat today, said that thing was sitting right back where I had taken it from? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> the Word of God teaches that articles of divination, and you'll have so-called paranormal experts. You'll have people try to tell you not to do this. Yet the Word of God tells us that this is exactly what we ought to do. Uh, the, the Word of God teaches that when people repented who had been engaged in witchcraft and the occult and all of these um, black magic and these sort of practices, that they would bring their articles of divination and their books, their literature related to these things, and burn them. You destroy them by fire. And uh, But you watch some of these paranormal television shows and they'll say, Oh no, if you burn them, you're going to release the spirit that's in them. Honey, there is no spirit in them. The spirit is not attached to the board. The spirit has really, the board only plays a role in your opening the door. The board itself doesn't amount to a hill of beans. All it's doing is it is the tool that you used to open a door. So when you're wanting to close that door and you no longer want to utilize that tool, you need to get rid of that article of divination, whether it be tarot cards, whether it be books of spells, whether it be books on witchcraft and the occult, whether it be a Ouija board, whatever the case might be. Um, you burn those things, and you renounce the activity that you engaged in in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning you, you literally voice, I renounce witchcraft in the name of Jesus Christ. I renounce tarot in the name of Jesus Christ. I renounce the Ouija board in the name of Jesus Christ. By doing so, you are spiritually, again, disconnecting yourself from that tool of divination, okay? Then you destroy the tool of divination. You're telling the spirits by doing so, I want nothing more to do with you, and I will not be trying to interact with you again. You see, so you're performing a literal physical act, but you're conveying a spiritual 
message. Okay? So that's really what it all boils down to is the messaging. The act is a matter of messaging. It's, it's, you're not destroying something that a demon is attached to, okay? No, you're destroying the tool that allows you access to that demon, the tool that uh, puts you in contact with that demon. All right, so... Um, the there's one example okay of uh people using a ouija board and opening the door uh i'm certain in this young lady's case that it was inadvertent she certainly didn't mean to open the door on purpose now let's look at yet another story and see what we can learn from this whoops no that yeah this is the other story Sorry about that, folks. I'm still uh, <laughs> trying to learn to run these controls and stuff. Okay, here you've got an example of where young people, just out of sheer curiosity, are bringing a Ouija board into their home, and they're beginning to experiment with it. And uh, Unbeknownst to them, they wind up inviting a spiritual presence into their home and they go through quite a battle trying to overcome it. Um, demons love to play games. And what I mean by that is uh, they love to... Uh, I'm trying to think of how I want to word this. I say play games, you know. Uh, for instance, this whole idea of the rules of the board, okay, you never play alone, you never play uh, with it in your own home, and you always say goodbye after. And uh, part of the reason that they have these sort of setups is because if you break the rules, you now have officially offered an invitation. Because why? We talked about it before, earlier in this study. You have been negligent. You have been careless. And they say, okay, fine. Hey, we set forth the rules of, uh, the, rules of the game. We set forth uh, 
how things were supposed to be done. But guess what? She didn't do it the way it was supposed to be done. And that gives us an open door. That gives us an invite. Okay? So uh, this is one of the examples of just being negligent and careless. You're dealing with spiritual things. You don't know what you're dealing with when you're dealing with something invisible and unseen. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, somebody can come to my door and introduce themselves and say, Hi, my name is uh, Jack Black and I am the mayor of, uh, of Huntsville, Alabama and I just wanted to come by and introduce myself. Well, I got news for you. I have no idea who the mayor of Huntsville is. I wouldn't know the mayor of Huntsville from anybody, okay? I can't tell you their name. I can't tell you anything. Could be a woman for all I know. I don't know anything about that. Uh, but human beings lie. People lie. They misrepresent themselves. They will tell you things about themselves that are untrue. Um, what makes me laugh is in the last few days... I've been under attack, I'm telling you, by people in this community who are part of the LGBT community. And one guy in particular, I've never seen such a lion demon in my life. He posted on something that somebody else had shared and said, Oh, I've done battle with this guy several times and, and blah, blah. And he claims to be a preacher and he claims to have a ministry and, and he doesn't have a church and he's complained over and over and over again on Facebook. Facebook about how people aren't flooding into his church and just rushing into his church and how come there aren't. And I'm sitting there and I'm reading this and this is what I'm talking about, folks. I don't handle this kind of foolish, foolishness very well. Um, I've been doing affirming ministry for 31 years. I never in a billion years would expect people to come flooding into my church. That's not how affirming churches grow. They're notoriously slow growing. And I know that. I've been doing this for many, many years. Now, I have preached and said while preaching, this church should be full. But I'm not talking about LGBT people exclusively for one thing. I'm simply talking about, hey, the message and the Spirit of God that flows in this church, the anointing that God has given this ministry, there's no excuse for this building not to be full. But that has, that, that's not me griping about, you know, LGBT people not flooding into the church, not by a million miles. And this guy said, oh, I've done battle with this guy several times. I had maybe two occasions, maybe, maybe, where he sent me a message on Facebook in response to something I had posted, and I just wrote him back a cordial response. We didn't have any kind of conflict. We didn't have any kind of back and forth. If it had gotten nasty or rude or mean or, or ugly, honestly, I block people like that because I don't need that garbage in my spirit. I, my, I'm too sensitive. I get too worked up too easily. So I'll, if somebody's being, you know, uh, argumentative and whatever, I just block them and move on. And, uh, but he was still a friend of mine. Okay. So obviously there had not been any contention or anything. Say now, pastor, why are you sharing all this? I'm trying to tell you if human beings in the flesh and blood world can fib and lie and tell untruths and uh, misrepresent things like this, why on earth would you think that something invisible is always, without fail, going to tell you the truth? Look at these paranormal shows. Look at these so-called paranormal experts. Every word that is spoken by the invisible entity they claim to be communicating with, every word they take as being true. 
And you see them, the thing that always makes me laugh is when they say, are you good or are you evil? The Bible said even Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Even the devil himself can appear as an angel of God if he wants to. That is how he is capable of being deceptive. Okay? And so the notion that asking it if it's good or evil is absolutely insane because it is under no obligation in any way, shape, size, or form to tell you the truth. Now, depending on its mission with any given individual, because you got to remember, we've talked about this again, We've already, and I told you, once we laid all that foundation, we're going to be going back and we're going to be pulling out of that foundation. I talked about the fact that demons, when they interact with human beings in the natural world, they are messaging, but they are not necessarily messaging through their words. They don't message through words. They message simply through the manifestation. So if, for instance, a spirit of fear wants to get its grasp on you and wants to get a hold of you and wants you to become vexed and oppressed by a spirit of fear, it may manifest itself where you see stories of people seeing these ugly demonic figures, you know, that are so horrible looking and uh, scary and all this. Uh, yeah, because that spirit is wanting to, in essence, scare you to death. It's trying to scare you to the point that you literally give yourself over to a spirit of fear and you become fearful. You become terrified. You live in a persistent, constant state of utter terror and fear. Some of these paranormal shows that we've watched We've seen characters, we've seen individuals who experienced just that. The experiences they had literally terrorized them to the point that they became fearful, so fearful, in fact, they won't leave their house, they won't go anywhere, they won't do anything. They're constantly in fear that another attack is coming, that something else is going to happen, that this a personage or this character that appeared to them is going to reappear. And what's happened is they've literally unwittingly given themselves over to a spirit of fear. And that spirit of fear is either vexing them or more likely at this point, once you've given yourself over to that fear and you've allowed that fear to overtake you. Why? Because you're not a believer. You're not approaching things from a biblical Christian perspective. And therefore, you, you don't understand the rules of battle. You don't understand spiritual warfare. You don't understand how to stave these things off. I remember as a young man growing up in a Pentecostal church in southern New England, uh, there was a lady in the church that I used to babysit for, and she had two kids, and I used to babysit for them. And one time, she and her husband were going to go see a movie. And uh, turns out, this is back in the 70s, and I'm old enough to have babysit in the 70s, and turns out they were going to see The Exorcist. Well, the exorcist in the 70s scared the life out of people. The movie was so powerful in generating fear in people that they literally began to flood the churches. Every church of every denomination benefited from the release of the movie, The Exorcist. Catholic churches were filling up. Baptist churches were gaining people. 
Pentecostal churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, churches benefited because this movie generated so much fear at the notion of a literal devil and demons and what they were capable of that people would go back to church. They were going to church. Well, this lady and her husband went and saw the movie, but they were believers. They were Christians. And she later told me, Trish later told me, she, uh, I mean, I would say months later or so, she told me, she said, do you know, Chuck, she said, that movie scared me so bad. She said, I never saw such a realistic, um, you know, the effects and everything in The Exorcist were, were quite uh, powerful. And she said, I never saw anything like that. She said, that movie scared me so bad. She said that in the days and weeks after the movie, she said, I could not walk down the hall of my house without turning on the light. And even with the light on, I was scared out of my mind. She said, I couldn't go to the bathroom without being scared out of my mind. She said, I couldn't sleep without a light on. She said, it literally got to the point over about a two or three month period. She said, where I couldn't even leave the house anymore. I was in such a state of fear. I was so overtaken by a state of fear and terror. She said, then finally one day, I don't remember if she said she was watching a Christian television program or something, but somehow she was reminded of the fact that as a believer, she had authority over any spirit that would try to vex her or that would try to oppress her. And she realized, she said, wait a minute. All this fear that has gripped me and that has overtaken me. She said, I went to this stupid movie. I probably shouldn't have. She said, and I opened the door and invited a spirit of fear into my life. And she said, Chuck, I went to the door of my apartment. I opened the door. They lived in an apartment complex where each uh, apartment was kind of like a townhouse. So they had a door that went directly outside. She said, I opened the door to our apartment. She said, and I said, I commend that spirit of fear that's been trying to vex me and oppress me. She said, in the name of Jesus, I command you leave, depart from me right now in Jesus' name. And she said, I kid you not. She said, I literally felt a hot wind from inside the apartment blowing outside through the door. She said, it moved my hair. I could feel it. It touched my car. I could feel it. She said, it was a hot wind that came out and blew outside. She said, and immediately I was delivered from that fear. She said, I no longer had to deal with that fear. But again, as a believer, she went and exposed herself to something that spiritually she wasn't quite ready to face. If she, if she had seen that film and really had a rock-solid understanding of the Word of God and really was in a place spiritually that she needed to be, it probably would not have been able to have had that effect on her. But she wasn't quite as steady on her feet as a believer as she thought she was and she wound up opening a door to vexation and that spirit took advantage of that and vexed her like crazy I'm going to tell you I had a spirit of fear try one time to uh, vex me and I can tell you um, how it happened um, I'd gone to New York for some something, I can't remember exactly what, um, although there are those in Huntsville who don't know me and don't know our ministry, uh, we have a very lively internet ministry and have had for many, many years. Uh, just because you don't see a lot of people watching a, a video live, um, 
that's because not everybody's available at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night to watch the video. But we have many, 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 many people who watch our videos on many, many, many different platforms. We are on more than YouTube. We're on more than Vimeo. We have channels on GodTube. We have channels on a number of different uh, sites. And we share our services, and uh, not live, but we share the video of our messages, I should say, our sermons, and our teaching on many, many different venues, many different locations. So you can't even begin to count all the, the views we get unless you go to all these different sites and look at the same video and count up, okay, they got 30 views on this site, they got 40 views on this site, they got 50 views on this site, you add them all up, that's how many views so far that video's had. We've done some Bible study series um, that have garnered thousands of views. So depending on the subject matter that we are looking at, our videos get literally thousands and thousands of views. Don't believe me? Look up our Grace Oasis DFW channel. That's our Dallas Church channel. I was in Dallas over 22 years. We had a uh, our church channel for the Dallas Church is still up and running. We still share all our Bible studies and all our sermons on that channel for the benefit of all the people there who have subscribed to our channel. We have 648 subscribers on the Dallas Church channel. We started out in Huntsville with, you know, five, six, seven subscribers, whatever it is. We are now, after a year, up to about 80, I believe it is, okay? So we have a very lively internet ministry. And uh, there are times when our internet members, our um, people who are part of our ministry, but not locally, but through the internet, there are times they may have a need of a pastor, and uh, they consider me, they call me their pastor. Uh, that's how much a part of our church they are. And I love them just, just like they're sitting in the pew. And if they need me, if, there's a, uh, if they need special counseling, if they need uh, to be baptized, if, if I don't care what, if they need me, if they want me to come pray for them to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to go. I'm going to get on an airplane and I'm going to fly. And any one of those members, I can promise you, will tell you that uh, I don't charge and I don't ask for a dime. A matter of fact, I really wish they wouldn't give anything most of the time. And the reason I say that is because I don't want somebody trying to make the accusation. The only reason I did it is because, quote, I got paid. Most of the time... If they're able to help me at all, it's to help offset the cost of the trip. But they're not paying for the entire trip. But, again, most of the time, uh, they are people who are not able to give anything at all in support of our ministry. I don't care. That doesn't matter to me. I could care less. Uh, if they have a need, I'm going to respond to that need. And I go on my own dime because we don't have a church here that is generating any kind of income. We don't have people supporting us sufficiently to generate any kind of an income to support me flying out to California or to support me flying to New York or to support me flying to Dallas or to support me flying to Austin, Texas. But in this one particular case, um, I had gone to New York City. There, uh, If I remember correctly, I think it was when a uh, husband and wife that I had met while we had our ministry in New York, straight folks, wanted to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And I flew to New York City at that time to baptize them. And they wanted me while I was there to dedicate their two children. So I dedicated their two children. One was still a baby. The other, uh, the little girl was, I think, maybe three or four years old. 
And uh, I had led them into Jesus' name, baptism, and the apostolic way. Uh, they were Baptists when I met them. And we had our outreach center in New York City uh, when Jason and I had our uh, Grace Oasis Apostolic Learning Center in New York City. That was at the very beginning of what was to be my affirming ministry. And anyhow, I flew up there so that I could do this for them. And I had several hours before uh, I was going to leave. And whenever I go to New York, I always try to see my buddy, Claude. I've been knowing this man for 30 years, and he's a lovely man. Uh, he's a, a wonderful supporter of this ministry, has been for decades now. And uh, if I go to New York, he and I would get together for dinner. We'd, you know, do something. We, you know, we always got together. Well, so he, I think somebody come up with it. And also my best friend, Jose, was living at that time. And I would always see Jose. So Claude, Jose, and I got together, had a steak. And uh, Jose recommended, why don't we go see a movie? And that'll kill some time before you have to leave for the airport. And I said, sure. So we went, and if I remember correctly, I, I want to make sure I'm right. I think it was the ring, either the ring or the, um, there was a Japanese movie, The Wraith. No, it was, no, it wasn't The Wraith. Anyway, it, it, I, it was an Asian movie, whether it was The Ring or there was this other one. And man, that movie, the effects in that movie were really, really uh, strange and, to be honest, realistic. And, and what I mean by that is, listen, I've cast demons out of people in churches. And I have seen with my own naked eye some of the things that I saw portrayed on the screen. In one scene, there's this Asian woman with long black hair coming down the stairs, you know, and she's coming down like on her back, like all uh, her arms behind her, and she's got her neck turned and all this. I've seen that in real life, folks. I've seen demon-possessed people do that in real life. So seeing it on the screen, it was very troubling you know because i'm like good god you know that looks so real that it looks that woman i've seen possess people do that well long story short that stupid movie wound up not that particular scene but the movie as a whole wound up kind of spooking me real bad and I'm one of those kind of people, when I get hot at night, you know, I stick a foot <laughs> outside of the blanket. My grandmother told me, my grandfather used to do the same thing. She said, your grandfather's done that our entire marriage. She said, if he gets hot, he just sticks a foot, sorry about that, outside of the blanket, you know, and that's how he kind of regulates his uh, temperature. And I said, yeah, that's something I've done for ages, you know. So anyway, um, it got to the place, though, because of this movie, it got to the place where I wouldn't stick my foot out of underneath the covers because all of a sudden I had this fear like that, that a demon was going to try to grab my foot just to, just to spook me, you know, just to startle me. And... I got to the point where I realized it didn't take long, you know, but I finally realized, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, this thing's trying to vex me. This spirit is trying to trouble me. I said, and it does not have any authority to do so, and I'm not going to allow it to do so. And I literally one day spoke and said, devil, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over you and I rebuke the spirit of fear. You will not trouble me. That's all it took. It was gone. 
Uh, now Tommy can tell you, you know, uh, if I get hot enough in the night, I, I lay on the bed without any covers on me at all. I'll push all the blankets off of me, you know. Um, but I still stick my foot or my feet out of underneath the covers if I get hot enough. So I'm just trying to illustrate. I'm trying to talk about the fact that uh, we can open doors, okay? Curiosity opens doors. Fear is a major trigger. The enemy loves fear. The Word of God said, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So there is a spirit that identifies by the name the spirit of fear. And I'm going to tell you, the spirit of fear, especially in a world like ours where people love to scare themselves to death, going to these stupid movies, going to amusement parks and riding rides that, you know, get their adrenaline going and going through haunted houses and all these sorts of things. Human beings love controlled fear. The problem is what they don't understand sometimes. When we expose ourselves to controlled fear, we can open ourselves up to uncontrolled fear. Fear that is in the form of a vexation or an oppression. And it becomes a major issue. And it can disrupt your life something awful. It can cause terrible things to happen. Uh, if a person's got a spirit of fear and they're scared out of their mind and they decide they're going to sleep with a gun next to the bed, next thing you know, their husband or their wife or somebody gets up to go to the bathroom. And when they come back in the room, their spouse blows their head off because they were so afraid and they didn't recognize, they didn't realize. There are times Tommy gets up and I don't even realize he's gotten up. I don't know how that happens, but it happens. The next thing I know, I look up, and there's somebody standing next to the bed. About, about sends me to the moon. And so, uh, you know, it happens. And if I were under the influence of a spirit of fear, and I kept a gun handy, there could be a major disaster come out of that. So, you know, a, even a spirit of fear can lead to some really uh, major trouble. Um, I think tonight I have more videos that I'm going to share with you. I hope you've enjoyed my doing that tonight. Uh, I do have more. We're going to look at a whole lot more over the next several weeks. And then we're going to uh, comment on them. And we're going to critique them, so to speak. Look at them from a biblical Christian perspective. Let me leave you tonight. We have about uh, 10 minutes to go. Let me just leave you with this reminder how important it is to respond to everything in our lives to the best of our ability. Now, we're, nobody's perfect. To respond to everything uh, to the best of our ability in a biblical Christian manner. That is is the key. If we're trying our best to follow the Lord's teachings, if we're doing our best to follow the Lord's uh, commandments, love one another, you know, don't allow anger to uh, reside more than a day, you know, get it settled, settle the matter before the end of the day. Don't allow bitterness to have a place in your heart. Don't allow vengeance a place, you know. Uh, if we'll do this, my friend, we guard ourselves and we protect ourselves. We are wearing the armor. We're wearing the full armor of God when we do this. The, bless, the breastplate of righteousness. What is righteousness? It is doing right, doing things the right way. If we strive to do things the right way, the Christian way, the biblical way, we are protecting our breast. We are protecting our heart. We are literally, I mean, the more, 
uh, the most sensitive part of our body, the easiest way to die is to take a shot through the heart. So by wearing the breastplate of righteousness, doing right, striving to live right and to do right, we protect ourselves from a fatal blow. And of course, the helmet of salvation is very simple. If we live our lives always mindful of what God has done for us, the greatest Christians I've ever met in my life who really know how to live this thing, I hate to say it, but way better than I do. Because anybody that knows me, you know, th this is the thing that frustrates me about these people online who, who try to tear me up and, you know, and destroy my reputation and all that. I'm as transparent as a piece of clear plastic. I don't... I don't stand here and try to tell people I'm perfect. I don't try to stand here and act like I live the Christian life better than anybody does. I've said a thousand times over, and Tommy can tell you, I've said it recently to him. I said, I really don't know why God ever called me to preach. I don't understand it. I feel like I'm the least qualified person on the planet. Um, I've got way too thin a skin. Things get under my skin way too easy. I, I hate false accusation. If you come against me and you're accusing me of something I've done, I'll admit it, I'll confess it, I'll acknowledge it, I'll own it. But if you're making accusations that are not true, you know, I've had people in the last few days trying to accuse me of being uh, anti-homeless and, you know, I'm, I'm classist and I don't care about those who are uh, economically challenged and all this sort of thing. And they don't understand, no, that is so far from the truth, it's not even funny. You've never met anybody probably that uh, cares as much about all of these things as I do. But at the moment, I'm trying to get a business enterprise off the ground, and that business enterprise has to be profitable because otherwise I'm out money that I can't afford to be out, you know. And I have to do things in a way that I'm going to be able to attract and maintain and keep a customer base, you know. And... Uh, uh, if I had the money and I could open a charity and I could just open up a, a community center where people can come in and hang out and we don't have to raise any money to pay for the lights and pay for the rent and pay for the uh, various amenities and what have you. If I had the money to do that, I'd do it in a flat minute. I don't have the money to do that. And on top of that, I need to make a living. So anyway, you know, but I have people throwing accusations. Actually, Amy, you'll get a chuckle out of this one because you know me well enough to know. I had some knucklehead say that because I referenced, uh, I referenced Trump and his clubs, I was trying to refer, I was trying to draw the concept of, you know, a members only club. And I said, you know, kind of like what Trump has. And this person online turned around and said, see him represent Trump shows me right there. There's something to worry about. Is there a person on this planet that is less a fan of Donald Trump than I am? Is there a person, is there a preacher on this planet who is from the pulpit preached the wickedness and the evilness of this man, really. But do you see what I'm saying? I mean, I, I've just had all kinds of negativity and false accusations and, and garbage being thrown at me in recent days. And it gets under my skin. I, I, I hate it. Sometimes I wind up finding myself trying to defend myself. And you know what? You, folks, you can't defend yourself because these same people, no matter what you tell them, they turn around, well, I don't care, blah, blah, blah. You know, so you're wasting your breath trying to defend yourself. But I do it because, foolish me, I think that if you approach people honestly, if you tell them what's going on with you and how things are going, you know, 
I've got this dumb idea in my head they're actually going to care and that they're going to take to heart what you're saying. They don't care and they're not going to take to heart. So you're wasting your breath. So I said all that to say, I really don't understand why the Lord called me to preach. I really don't. God is my witness. I do not. Of all the men in the world, I feel probably less qualified than any. But I'll tell you this much. I know this much. My faith is as real as anything you'll ever find in your life. There isn't a demon in hell that rattles my cage because I know where I stand in the power of God. I know where I stand as a child of God. I know my authority over devils through the power of the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. And I know that it's my job to encourage God's people to live right, to do right, to act right. And by that, I don't mean don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. I believe preachers are supposed to preach what we ought to be doing and not what we shouldn't be doing. If you teach God's people to pray, if you teach God's people to draw closer to the Lord, if you teach God's people to be faithful to the house of God, if you teach God's people to strive to live a life of love and a life of compassion and a life of grace and a life of mercy and a life of charity, and that is the message we preach in our church. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> Anyway, if you preach what God's people ought to be doing, then you encourage them. And I, I encourage myself every Sunday. I listen to our messages after uh, the service, and I find myself preaching to myself and encouraging myself to step up higher. And like I preached this Sunday, um, Tommy and I, uh, you know... <sighs> We're, we're not thrilled right now where we're at. We're not thrilled, especially in light of some of the garbage that's gone on the last few days. But I preached it, and I live what I preach. We're going to make the best of it. We're going to do everything in our power to do the best we can do while we're here. And uh, we're going to live like the children of Israel were encouraged by the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah to live while they were in bondage to Babylon. He said, do the best you can while you're there because I've got plans for you. I don't know what God's plans are for our ministry. I don't know what God's plans are for my life. I hope to heavens uh, it's better than the ditch. I hope it's better than being sold into slavery. I hope it's better than going to prison because Potiphar's wife got out of control. Uh, I don't need to be the second man in the land of Egypt. I have no aspirations for that at all. But God knows one day, one day, I'd love to have a church full of people who love the Lord as much as I do, who want to worship God, who want to do right, who want to pray, who want to see a move of God like they've never seen before in their lives. And uh, I don't say like I've ever seen because honestly, folks, I'm going to tell you, I've seen a move of God in my life that blows away anything I see in churches today. And if we could get to the place where God could move like that, in our church, I'd be the happiest man on the planet, and it wouldn't matter to me if we had 30 members or 3,000. wouldn't matter an ounce to me. As long as we were people that love God and want to worship, want to pray, want to seek His face, want to serve Him, and uh, that would throw my soul. All right, folks, listen, I've kind of babbled for a moment at the end. Uh, this is the end of this week's study. Next week, we will have more. And as this study progresses, what we're going to do, we're going to show videos that illustrate many different scenarios that we've talked about. And uh, so you're going to be able to see, I'm going to be able to talk to you and show you. Here's this person's story. Look at this person's story. Listen to the information they're giving. And if you listen, if you watch, a lot of times you're able to extract from what they're saying exactly 
what kind of spirit they're dealing with, uh, where it came from, uh, who opened the door, whether it's the individuals themselves or somebody prior to them maybe that lived on that property, and you know, so on and so forth. We're going to be looking into all that, and I think in the weeks to come, you're really going to enjoy this study, okay? Let's close right now with a word of prayer, if we may. Father, once again, God, we come before you, and we thank you for this time in the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the encouragement and the inspiration that the Word of God affords us, reminding us of the power of the Holy Ghost and the authority of the great name of Jesus, Jehovah our Savior. Master, empower the church of God. Empower the people of God. Those that are watching, Lord, who may uh, be going through experiences of a paranormal nature, let their eyes be opened and let them understand and let their faith burgeon. Let it break forth right now in the name of Jesus so that they might believe God and embrace the authority and the power that they have through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they might be delivered and set free from every oppression and every vexation. Master, today, go with us from this place, great God. Keep us, Lord, in your care. We live today in such an evil and wicked world, the word of God declaring, in the last days, wicked men shall wax worse and worse. And we're seeing it, Lord, in government. We are seeing it in pulpits. We are seeing it in communities. My God, have mercy. Anybody with the desire to live right and do right is under a constant barrage from the enemy. And Master, we need the staying power of the Holy Ghost in our lives if we're going to maintain our faith, even in the face of our own weakness and failures. We thank you, Master, for tonight. Keep us, Lord, under your mighty hand. Let the angels of God encamp round about them that love you. For we ask it all today and none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Folks, we have church at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a midday uh, service. If you read in Scripture, uh, it says on the third hour of the day, many great things. Pentecost happened at the third hour of the day. The Lord rose from the dead at the third hour of the day. Many great things in the church occur at the third hour of the day. Now, I'm going to tell you honestly, 3 o'clock is not the equivalent to what you read in the Bible of the third hour of the day. So I'm not trying to say it is, but in a figurative sense, okay, the three o'clock time is a great time. Hallelujah. Come be with us for church at the Century Office Complex, uh, 3322 Memorial Parkway Southwest, suite number 537. That is in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, five, uh, three, five, eight, oh, one. We need people to come. I'm going to tell you why. This old preacher preaches his heart out, and I need support. I need people there in the seats encouraging and supporting me uh, because the work I'm doing is not an easy work and never has been. Progressive Pentecostal LGBT affirming ministry is about the hardest work you'll ever, ever set your hand to. So I need support. I'm not asking for your money. I'm asking you to be there to help hold up Moses' hands so that we can win this battle and we can create a church that will set an example for the world what Christianity and Christian churches ought to look like. Then also, I hope you'll join us next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. We do our Bible studies right now online, and I hope you'll invite us once again online for our Bible study. Until we meet again, as always, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.